Okay, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Um, I would like to um, say that today I have a lot of things to cover, and I'm actually um, developing, give, going to give some new ideas and new materials which have been shaping up for a long time. But uh, uh, finally, I've got some clarity on what we need to do. <coughs> So, because this is going to be um, fairly long, I will um, start uh, right away and hope I can cover everything in one hour and then there will be 30 minutes for question and answers. So I'm going to share the screen. Sorry, you're still in mute. Okay, so I hope that uh, you can hear me now. Yes, we can hear you now. Good. And uh, is screen sharing still on? You can yes. see my slide? Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. All right, so before we start, just some uh, the, the slides have been uploaded to SlideShare and are available from this uh, link given here. So you can um, get them. I have made a few modifications. One, one or two slides will not be there. But uh, then there is a weekly mailing list uh, that you can join. And that's uh, um, available for uh, anybody. Uh, I have noticed that a lot of people on the mailing list don't get my emails because it is marked as spam. So something that you need to do is to go into your uh, box and uh, get uh, retrieve one of these emails and sort of you have to put it on a whitelist so that you can receive these emails. I have created a new website which has all the course materials. And uh, this course is also available on the Al Nafi platform where you can go through it in sequence and step by step. So these are some of the uh, links that are uh, useful for later use. Now, let me start this lecture by um, ayat of the Quran. A'uzu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Zahar al-fasad fi al-barri wa al-bahri bima kasabat aydi al-nas. Liyudhiqahum ba'da al-lazi amilu la'allahum yarja'un. So this ayat in the Quran says that the corruption in the land and sea occurs by the reason of our amal. And um, Allah Ta'ala gives us a little bit of a taste of what we have uh, done, the consequences of what we have done. And this is not as punishment on this earth. On the earth, we are given this taste so that we can return to Allah Ta'ala and correct our deeds. Because if we didn't see the consequences of our deeds, then we will, um, we can continue to make more and greater mistakes. So the key solution then, see the problems are caused by our amal. They're not caused by external circumstances. So the solution is to change ourselves. Allah Ta'ala will not change our external conditions until we change what is inside us. 
So <clears throat> Allah Ta'ala has given us the complete and perfect deen and he says that uh, this is um, the greatest gift of Allah Ta'ala for mankind. So it often happens that what we think conflicts with what the Quran says. And today it is common for us to adjust the Quran instead of our thoughts. Because that is easier. We reinterpret the Quran to make it in line with the way we think. So it is much harder to do the opposite, but that is what we need. We need to adjust our ways of thinking. We have to take the Quran as given that this is the truth. And if my thinking is uh, not aligned with that, then I have to change my way of thinking. I don't, I shouldn't change the Quran. So this is very difficult to do because changing our thoughts requires changing our actions. Our thoughts are tied to the way we act. So they are designed to justify how we act to ourselves. So to change our thinking, we have to change our actions. So <clears throat> the Quran was complete and perfect guidance and it started with the command to read and Allah Ta'ala gave knowledge. Allah Ta'ala will Allah insanu ma'alam yalam. Allah Ta'ala gave knowledge to mankind which they did not have. This knowledge had tremendous impact on the world. It took the backward Bedouin and made them world leaders and it created a civilization which was the world leader in knowledge for more than a thousand years. So this knowledge is very powerful. So the question is, what was this knowledge that Allah Ta'ala gave to the early Muslims? And do we still have this knowledge? If we had this knowledge, then we wouldn't be in the bad condition that the Muslims are today. And then the question is, does this knowledge still have the same revolutionary power that it did 1400 years ago? So it seems as if it does not because we have this knowledge and we are not, we're not launching a revolution. But if we accept what the Quran says is true and change what, what our thoughts are telling us, then we have to realize that it must be the case that we don't have this knowledge because if we did, then this knowledge would teach us how to change the world. So this is the critical question. What does the Quran teach us about how to change the world today? So some of the lessons that I've already given that the Quran tells us that you have to change yourselves if you want to change the world. So one of the reasons that we are unable to see the treasure of the Quran is because we are following blindly the Jews and the Christians as reported in Hadith that there will come a time when we will follow the ways of the Jews and the Christians. There is a prophecy that Islam came as a stranger and it will become a stranger. So blessed are the strangers. So we have to become strange. If we will follow Islam, we will appear to be very strange to our fellows. So instead of uh, seeking guidance from the Jews and the Christians, instead of asking a Harvard professor to solve our economic problems, we should turn to the Quran. So today, we are, uh, the problem is that we are very impressed by the West. So every Muslim student around the world will know the name of Einstein. And there is a book about Einstein and how he made a great blunder, in, uh, which has been put out recently. And there are many flaws in Einstein's personality. But he is thought of as one of the most intelligent men in the world, and not just by non-Muslims, but also by Muslims. As opposed to this, uh, one of the great mashayikh of Islam uh, recently died in 2018, five years ago. Uh, nobody knows his name. So <clears throat> the most important questions that face us is the answer to why was this universe created? Who created it? For what purpose? Why were we created? What is the purpose of my life? What can I do to fulfill this purpose? What kind of knowledge do I need 
to lead the best possible life that I can on this planet. So the question is, who had this knowledge? Einstein or Sheikh Murabat al-Hajj? If uh, Einstein did not have this knowledge, and we know that he did not, then how come we think he is the very wise man? And how come we have no knowledge of Sheikh Murabat al-Hajj? This is just to demonstrate that what we think of as knowledge and what we think of as wisdom has been conditioned by our education. It is a wrong, it is a wrong education. It teaches us to value things which are not valuable and it teaches us to ignore the things which are important. So the answers to the critical questions, Allah Ta'ala tells us that the universe was created as a testing ground for us. It is a temporary place where we will stay for a short while. Western education says that the universe was created in an accident. Just it happened all by itself. And uh, Allah Ta'ala teaches us that there is a purpose of our life. We have a very short life. And in this life, Allah Ta'ala خلق الموت ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عملا So he created life and death to see who will do the best deeds. So that is the purpose of our life, to do the best deeds. Uh, Western education teaches us that our lives are meaningless. We will, uh, we will all die and we will become dust and nothing happens after that. So how do we do the best deeds? Allah Ta'ala teaches us that the Sharia has been given to us, the, the law of Islam. And this is the path to success. The Sharia actually means the road or the path and so if we follow the Sharia, we can reach, tells us how to live our lives so that we can reach success on the day of judgment. As opposed to this, Western education says that man is an animal. We are all in a jungle. This is cutthroat competition. There is only one rule, survival of the fittest. You either kill or you are killed. So your job is to kill everybody and become the survivor. So these are the answers which Western education provides us. So again, there is the question of knowledge. What kind of knowledge should we seek? So Islam teaches us that we need to learn that the, the real success is on safe, safe day of judgment. So how do we succeed? Uh, how to do the best deeds? What is a good deed? What is a bad deed? What is the knowledge which will allow us to do the good deeds and succeed? In the West, uh, there is no akhira, there is no God, there is no judgment, there is no afterlife. So the only thing is how to succeed in this world. Success means uh, uh, power, pleasure, profits, all the benefits of this dunya. Survival of the fittest is the only moral law. And that is why the West started global colonization and conquest. And that is the best way to maximize wealth and power. And knowledge of building bombs and weapons and organizing uh, economic power to, to dominate. That is useful knowledge. Knowledge of how to succeed in the day of judgment, that is useless knowledge for the, according to the West. So they don't teach any of that. They only teach how to get power, how to get pleasure, how to get profits. <clears throat> so uh, when this kind of um, lecture is given, Muslims immediately ask the following question. Well, if we start focusing on success of the Akhira, then automatically we will uh, lose our focus on this dunya, so we will become failures in this dunya. So Allah Ta'ala reassures us that So if you believe and follow Allah, then you will also be given worldly success. And if you look at the rise of Islam, you will see that the Muslims are pursuing the pleasure of Allah and they created the greatest empire that mankind has seen with the help of Allah. And they did something which has never before been seen. They took uh, two advanced civilization which have been in existence for hundreds of years and they destroyed both of them, uh, just a handful of Muslims. So the worldly power was given to the Muslims because they pursued the success of the Akhira. So it's not that we will become failures in dunya if we uh, focus on pleasing Allah Ta'ala and success of the Akhira. So we have just reviewed that the Quran says that 
uh, corruption occurs on the land and sea, bad things happening. Today we are seeing lots of bad things. Why? Because of our Ill, evil deeds. And Allah Ta'ala will not change our condition until we change ourselves. So how do we change society? By changing ourselves. So today, the majority of the efforts that we are making are telling other people that you should be doing this and you should be doing that and the leaders should be doing that and the USA should be doing that and Belgium should be doing this and Africa should be doing this. But nobody, talk, nobody talks about what I should be doing. And that's the only thing which matters. If you want to change the world, I am the only one I can change. And I am the world. So we have to recognize our colonized minds. Because uh, one simple sign is that we know who Einstein is. And we don't know who Sheikh Murabit al-Hajj was. And that's a sign of colonization. We know what is the... Uh, who is the who are the heroes of the West? We don't know who are the heroes of Islam. So uh, we have been taught that the by our education that the purpose of our life is to maximize pleasure. This is what economics teaches. And then, of course, useful knowledge is that which will help us achieve this goal. So this is about producing goods and consuming goods. There is no concept of spiritual progress. Because we are just another kind of animal. Animals don't have spiritual progress. So first thing we do is to remember the message of the Quran. That whoever saves one life, it is as if he has saved one, uh, the entire mankind. So in the eyes of Allah Ta'ala, one life is just as precious as all of mankind. So saving one life, just my own life, is like saving all of mankind. So... Uh, hadith says that don't consider any good deed as small, even smiling on the face of your brother. So we are thinking that, who am I? I'm a little person. And what can I do? I can do only little things. So in the eyes of Allah, if I can change my life, this is as if we have changed the whole world, all of humanity. And if I can do one small good deed, that can be as valuable as uh, huge deeds. And we will see. So the key to the revolution, to make a big change in the world, we have to start by making small changes within ourselves. Now, it seems very paradoxical. So does it mean that we should go and retire into a cave and uh, do zikr of Allah? And if we do that, and maybe we do that, that will make us bring us close to Allah, then uh, but not, the world will not change. So it doesn't seem doesn't make any sense. But as I said, when you take the Quran as your gold standard and you say that, okay, if it doesn't make sense, it's because my thinking is wrong. So I have to change my thinking. Then you can understand the solution to this problem. So the solution is that the how do we make change in ourselves? By trying to change the world. And uh, Allah Ta'ala has told us how to struggle with the world. So this is a very subtle point. You have to think about it. <clears throat> and one example which makes it clear is the isometric exercise. So I say in an isometric exercise, I stand near the wall and I use both of my hands and I push the wall as hard as I can. Now this seems like a silly thing to do because the wall is not going to move. But the goal is not to move the wall. The goal is to build strength of my muscles. So just like that, you see, when you see somebody jogging and you say, oh, he's going very fast, he's trying to get to some place and you offer him a ride that, okay, why don't you come in my car and I will take you there very quickly. So he says, no, no, I'm not trying to get to any place. The jogging itself is, is building my strength. So we struggle against the world, not because we want to change the world, but because we want to uh, build our spiritual uh, progress. So when you make a mistake, so lots of people, lots of people are working on trying to create Islamic government, trying to bring out the Khalafa and basically changing the whole world. And then they are very disappointed. Oh, we have been working for decades and no Islamic government in sight, no Khalafa in sight. Uh, we have been working on trying to eliminate Bida, but there is no reduction. It's increasing. So as long as when you're looking at the external world for results, then you will be disappointed. The wall did not move. But if you make the intention of changing yourself, you will see that if you try to implement the orders of Allah, 
in our lives and in the society, you will sense your own spiritual progress and you can sense it from day to day, from the morning to the night, you will see a change in yourself. And that is the revolution. The revolution starts inside us. So how do we create an Islamic society? That is the problem that is in front of us. And so we have a three-dimensional approach, which I have outlined in other places, but it's very simple. We describe where are we, where do we stand right now? And uh, we, we are all living in a market society created for and required by a capitalist economic system. And this is very far from the ideal. So what is an ideal society of Islam? Well, a capitalist society is built on greed, competition, and individualism and hedonism, pursuit of pleasure in this dunya. Uh, an Islamic society is built on gener generosity, cooperation, on social responsibility, taking care of those who are poor and needy and powerless, and on striving for success in the Akhirah. So obviously, in every, in every dimension, we are living in a society which is the opposite of what is desirable. So then the question is, the third dimension is transformative. So we've, we've described where we are, where we want to go. Now, what is the path which will lead us from where we are to where we want to go? So how can we get from a market society to an Islamic society? So that is the goal of this lecture. So as I said, the first step is to have a clear idea of where we stand. So since we live in a capitalist society, we will uh, look at the capitalist ideas about that society. So this is a sensible definition of what is a society. And this is very important to understand. What is a society? It is a network of social relationships. Uh, so we have roles and responsibilities within that society. I expect that, you know, when I... Um, uh, buy a uh, good from the store. I expect that the store owner has taken, uh, provided me with good quality of goods. And the store owner expects that I am uh, giving him uh, correct currency, not fake currency, and so on. So there are many things. Uh, I am supposed to be working at a job to provide money for my family, and many things. So uh, that's general what is a society. Now, what is a market society? So this is something that we need to understand because this is not contained in your regular economic textbooks and not even in your Islamic economic textbooks. So the central characteristic of a market society is that it is based on massive overproduction. It produces much, 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 much more than what is necessary for lives of people. So to think, of, um, uh, to think of this, let's divide the goods into two categories. There are needs and there are wants. So uh, now we define needs broadly uh, in Islamic style. I will get to that later. And, uh, but outside of the needs, there is a huge amount of production of W. W is both wants and W also stands for wasteful. So basically, the key to understand a market society is that W-type production and consumption is much, much, much larger than uh, what is necessary. So we, are, we, we produce a lot of waste and we consume a lot of waste. So to understand uh, what is necessary, uh, Allah Ta'ala specifies it very clearly that we can eat and drink and enjoy comfort and even beautify our life, but we should not do israf and we should not do tabzir. Do not spend more than what is uh, needed, do not waste, and do not spend money on that which is haram and prohibited. So um, this is a standard classification that what what uh, what is allowed is necessities, what we need for ourselves, comforts, anything which makes us more comfortable, and uh, beautification. You can decorate your uh, house, you can make your clothing more beautiful. But the fourth thing is excess. 
which is uh, there are many categories which fall into excess and haram for example having a huge uh, wedding celebration and spending money on music and lights and things like that which are unnecessary and which are done very commonly because why because the society expects it from us so uh, things like that are uh, israf or tabzir so very contrary to the teachings of islam allah taala says that you are welcome to follow uh, your needs do enjoy this world take comfort beautify life but do not follow idle desires so as opposed to normal economics normal economics encourages wasteful production and wasteful consumption because a uh, market society depends on creation of waste but the quran prohibits wasteful production and wasteful production it says that do not follow your desires because they will lead you astray it says that uh, do not prefer the life of the do not enjoy any do not uh, prefer the life of this world and so if you fear your allah and we you restrain your souls from acting according to the desires so we have a lot of desires we want to do a lot of wasteful things but we have to prevent this is exactly the opposite of economic theory it says that you have to pursue all of your desires fulfill your desires but islam teaches us no you can fulfill your jaiz desires your permissible desires but you have to stop your soul from following the wrong desires so now in a market society um you need to produce w goods wasteful goods which nobody wants and um, so how are you going to do that well uh, the solution is marketing you have to convert wants into needs you have to make people say that for social status you have to have a car and you have to have these things um, otherwise you will not have any standing in society <coughs> so this creates a cycle people want the w goods and then they have to labor to earn wages but when they labor to in order to buy these w goods and when they labor they produce the w goods also so this is leads to what says law that the if you create the goods um suppose you start producing the goods uh then you will pay wages to the laborers the laborers will have the wages which they will use to buy the goods so it's a sort of a cycle but the key thing for us to understand here is that capitalism manufactures the goods but it also manufactures the desire for wasteful goods and this is contrary to islam we need to this is the front at which uh, modern economics collides with islamic economics because modern economics says that yes you should pursue your wasteful goods desires because that's needed to run the economy if you don't uh, if you stop following your wasteful desires then you will stop producing wasteful goods and the economy will collapse aggregate demand will collapse so but islam says that desire for wasteful goods is wrong and uh, not permissible so economists uh, believe in this theory of consumer sovereignty and uh, that whatever the desire you have to fulfill it it doesn't matter whether it's good or bad whether it's haram or halal whether it's wasteful or necessary the goal of life is to maximize the pleasure from consumption of goods and services you have to under this is statement is written in all economic textbooks we have to understand that this is not science this is a religion this is something which is a mistake which many people have made they th- think of economic as a science but this idea that our goal of life is to maximize the pleasure from consumption of goods this is a religion this religion is identified in the quran as the worship of the nafs and so economic theory is actually worship of the nafs it's also un- identified as nafs ammara you have you have to do whatever the nafs commands you to do but we are not permitted to the nafs amara is the lowest spiritual state 
which we are not allowed to have. So how can we change this? Well, we are taught, we are trained to think our, of ourselves as labor. And uh, we do the labor and we produce wasteful goods and we create for ourselves wage income. Uh, but we provide more profits to the capitalists in the profit uh, in the process of laboring. So what they what the capitalists do with these profits, uh, they've already produced the goods, but they also have to produce the demand for the goods. And so they use this they use this profits to advertise to create in us the desire for buying these wasteful goods. And so we we earn this income and then we. Uh, by producing wasteful goods, and we spend this income by buying wasteful goods. So it's a self-sustaining sustaining system. On the other hand, we labor to earn wages, wages allow and, and produce wasteful goods, and these wages allow us to buy the wasteful goods. So we have to break out of this cycle. And uh, we can't you know, make revolutionary changes in one step, so we just make small changes, one step at a time reduce the purchase of wasteful goods uh, and reduce our labor. Yeah, when we, we, we don't need to buy so much waste, then we don't need to work as hard to earn as much income. And so this will free us both on the mental side, we don't need to buy those things, and on the labor side, we don't need to work to buy those sides. And how do we do that? Well, that was covered in the first lesson, if we learn to be content with what we have, then we will not desire more goods. If we give shukr to Allah for what we have, Allah Ta'ala will increase our blessings. And this can be in the form of more goods or just more um, happiness with what we already have. And if we trust in Allah that when we make these changes to move one step towards Allah, then Allah Ta'ala will take 10 steps towards us. He will not abandon us here because you... The shaitan uh, makes us fear that if we step out of the system, if we reduce our engagement, we will become poor. So one of the things that we should do in order to reduce our desire for wasteful goods is to spend on the needs of others instead of, instead of our own wants. <coughs> In our neighborhood, there will be people who don't have enough for their basic needs. There are people who are uh, who can't buy their own medicine. There are people who can't buy food. So instead of spending money in luxury uh, restaurants and in uh, in getting the finest and and best goods, we should prioritize the needs of other over our own uh, luxuries. And uh, this is actually built into our hearts. And Hadith says that you should spend time with the poor. This will soften our hearts and it will appeal to us uh, to, it will make us realize that our problems are, are very small and uh, it will motive us, motivate us to help. So what will happen if we start this strategy? Well, we will have lower standards of living. We will have simpler li live lives. And this action uh, of uh, changing our behavior will change our beliefs. So it will, uh, it will break us out of the capital. The capitalist system says that you have to pursue more and more goods. You have to, you have to pursue more and more income. When we start breaking out, we will see that we don't need more and more income and we don't need more and more goods. And we can trust in Allah Ta'ala to fulfill our needs. So, ash-shaytanu ya'idukum min al-ya'idukum al-faqr wa ya'murukum al-fasha wa allahu ya'idukum maghfiratum minhu fazla. So, don't fear Allah, the, the idea that shaytan will say that, oh, if you stop earning, or if you reduce your earnings, then you will become faqir. No, because Allah Ta'ala has promised his maghfira and his fazl, his uh, bounty. So, he will, he will give whatever you lose by dropping out of capitalism and pursuing uh, Islamic society. So once we have saved our time and effort and energy, what should we do with this? So 
remember that a society is defined by social networks. So one part is to reduce our engagement with the capitalist social net networks. The capitalist system defines us as you are a laborer, you are a consumer, you are a producer, you are a boss, you are an employee, etc. There, there are many different roles in a capitalist society. <clears throat> so <clears throat> in these roles, we have to change the roles from um, market roles, which are uh, for money, to social roles. So this means reimagining the uh, market. But more importantly, we have to build the social networks of an Islamic society and prioritize them. So the first thing is to build myself, which means that I should pursue excellence in conduct. And that is uh, Prophet Muhammad wasallam was the most excellent role model for us in terms of conduct. Then uh, we go to strong family. This is the uh, key unit of a uh, Islamic society. So we have to build our families. We have to build uh, communities. And Allah Ta'ala tells us about the kinfolk. And uh, so much uh, emphasis is placed on uh, Sila Rahmi. And also a lot of emphasis on our neighbors. So the neighborhood community. So with this effort, we have to build these social relationships and uh, serve our uh, neighborhood and kinfolk. So um, the first step of this is self-transformation, change my own life. So remember that one life is as precious as all of humanity. What does this mean? How can one equal one equal uh, six and a half billion? This doesn't make sense mathematically. Well, this is in terms of potential. Just like a seed has the potential to become a tree, and the tree can pro produce thousands of seeds, which can produce millions of trees. And so one seed is equal to one million or one billion seeds if it develops its potential. Just like that, if we develop our potential, we can be, we can change the world. And how do we develop this potential? By struggling to change the world. Not with the idea of changing the world, but with the idea of changing ourselves. But as a side effect of this effort on the external world, uh, the external will, world will actually change by the will of Allah. So, what is the, so how do we struggle with the world? Well, there are lots of movements in Islam and they are all doing right. You have to understand that we have to uh, be united as an ummah. This is one of the orders of Allah. So we should not, we should not say that you are doing wrong and you are doing wrong. So there are people who are working for Khilafah, there are people who are working on Jihad, people working on Tabligh, people working on government, there are people who are saying that we need to return to the Salaf, uh, people who are working on Islamization of knowledge, there are people who are working on Sufi tariqats and our uh, spiritual development people who work on <coughs> many other <coughs> methodologies for revival of Islam. So there are 72 branches of faith and all of them are important. We don't, we don't deny, we don't denigrate, we don't minimize, we don't belittle our brothers who are working in any um, dimension of the faith because there's so much work to do. There are so many battles to be fought that um, we cannot fight all of them. So we are happy that somebody is fighting on the front, which we cannot take care of. All of these branches have a place in the Islamic revival. <clears throat> but um, remember that this message of Allah Ta'ala starts with Iqra and says that Allam al insan ma'alam ya'lam. <clears throat> so we know that knowledge, the right kind of knowledge is at the root of an Islamic revival. But what kind of knowledge is that? So among uh, the many kinds of efforts, it is the community which is the core because the community is the driver of social change. One man by himself cannot change the world, but he can build a community and that community can change the world. And this is exactly what the Prophet did. And this is signaled in the 
ayat that Allah Ta'ala united their hearts uh, when the Muhajireen came to uh, Medina. Then Allah Ta'ala united the hearts of the Muhajireen and the Ansar. And Allah Ta'ala says that this is such a precious gift that if you had spent all of the wealth on the earth, you could not have done this. So the unity of the hearts is a bigger treasure than all of the wealth on this planet. So instead of pursuing GDP per capita, the Quran tells us to pursue love. <clears throat> so how do we start? So uh, the family is the building block of the community. So we need to strengthen our relationships by parents, with our spouse, with our children, and with our extended family. And how do we do that? Well, by prioritizing family over our career. The cap Basically, you can say that what defines capitalism is that you prize your career over your family because uh, your career is your role in the capitalist economy. So if that is more important than your family, that means you're a capitalist. So if your family is more important than your career, then that means that you are trying to build an Islamic society. So if you take nothing else from this lecture, this is the central takeaway. Work on building your family by investing time in your relationships with your family. And this is also mentioned in the Quran and Hadith. And how do we do that? Well, uh, the families break up because people think that he is doing me harm. So Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran that if somebody does you harm, you should return that by doing something good. And that will, uh, that will change the hearts of the people. And the same thing is mentioned in the Hadith that Allah Ta'ala, the Prophet Sallallahu said that what is Sila Rahmi? It is not to return a good deed for a good deed. It is when your uh, relatives do bad to you and then you respond by doing good to them. So we should do whatever it takes to strengthen our family ties because actually what is critical today is that the family is under attack. The family has already broken up. It is completely shattered in the West. Uh, more than 50% of children are being born outside of uh, marriage to single mothers. And these same pressures are applying <clears throat> to the Islamic world today. And families are breaking up in the Islamic world. So this is the most critical front on which we must fight. And unfortunately, Muslims are not even aware that this is a front. They are battling on all other fronts. They're talking about trade and exports and uh, dollar. But they're not talking about what we need to do to strengthen our families. And the families are the building block of the Islamic society. So how do we strengthen the family? Well, both Hadith and the Quran mention the importance of love. There is a Hadith that believers, a believer loves and he is loved. And uh, there is no khair in someone who is not loved by his neighbors. So um, there are two Hadith about you will not enter paradise until you believe and you will not believe until you love one another. And um, you should spread salam in order to achieve this love. But spreading salam is not just words. You have, when we say salam, alaikum, we should say it with our hearts. And what does it mean to say it with our hearts? It means that we are concerned about you, your condition, and we hope that you have peace. And if there is something troubling you, we will help you. Find that peace. And uh, another hadith which says that we are merciful and kind to each other and we love each other. And we are like one body. So that if any part of the body feels pain, we should also feel that pain. So service to is the key to community. How do we build relationships? We build by, instead of, you know, uh, what capitalism teaches us is to Obey the nafs. Follow your idle desire. So today, whenever we have a free moment, we say, okay, what would I like to do? I want to watch a movie. I want to play a game. I want to go um, for uh, something which will make me happy. So instead of that, think about what can I do to make uh, somebody else happy? And that is the, uh, instead of thinking about your own happiness, 
there's a very interesting experiment <clears throat> One uh, person uh, uh, gathered 1,000 people and he had each person fill up a balloon and put in their name inside that balloon in writing. <clears throat> then all of the 1,000 balloons were mixed up and people were said, go and find your own balloon. So at the end of half an hour, very few people had their own balloons. There were so many balloons you couldn't find. Nobody could find the own balloon. So then he said, okay, let's do this in another way. You go and pick up one balloon and look at the name on that balloon and give that balloon to the person with that name on it. <clears throat> so in five minutes, everybody had their own balloon. So what do we learn from this? If you think about the happiness of others, everyone in the society will be happy. But when you're thinking about your own happiness, nobody will be happy. <clears throat> so some practical strategies on how to create change. There is a nice verse by Allama Iqbal, that if we focus on just one thing, then uh, we will be protected from a thousand problems. So a very practical strategy is that I have a limited amount of energy don't stop, don't, don't fight all the battles. Uh, don't fight for your worldly goods. Don't fight. Uh, there, there's a curtain of darkness which is following your desires and trying to achieve uh, worldly goals, <clears throat> uh, which capitalism. But there's also uh, Nurani uh, Parde, curtains of light. Uh, these are Islamic battles, which seem like yani, they are good things to do, like pursuing um, some ends which might have uh, a, a beneficial Islamic outcome. The thing is that you should be doing things where you can be effective. So, as I say, lose 1,000 battles in order to win one. Fight, put all your effort into winning one battle. Now, if, it, if you are a politician, if you are placed in a play, uh, government, then you should be working on fixing that. But if you are, but if, if I'm living in um, Pakistan, I shouldn't be worrying about American foreign policy. I have no, nothing I can do about that. So, and, and but unfortunately we are worrying about, you know, what's happening in Brazil and what's happening in Japan and not worrying about what's happening in my home. So focus your energies on fighting one battle and win that, put everything into winning that one battle. <coughs> so um, how do we win that one battle? Well, take a big battle and uh, like building social networks, which we will uh, I'll discuss in greater detail. Uh, so this, is, this is going to take a year, 10 years, 100 years maybe uh, the, if we uh, so what you do then you become discouraged so divide that into a small okay there's a big battle but divide it into very small steps and then take one uh, take one step on one day take a goal for uh, one day and fulfill that goal and then feel happy that i have taken one step towards a goal which is a thousand miles distant and thank Allah. If you give thanks to Allah that I was able to do this one little thing, Allah Ta'ala will enable to do you a lot more because those who make shukr, Allah Ta'ala increases their blessings. So what is the task? We want to build an Islamic community. Now this is actually a hugely difficult task. You shouldn't take it easy. You shouldn't think that this is easy. We have to build relationships. Every relationship requires time and effort and energy. So there are um, there is a neighborhood community, there is a work community, there is a family community, and today we have virtual communities. So if you think about building all these communities, you just won't have enough time in your life to do that. So what should you do uh, if you don't have time to build all of those relationships? If you work on one thing, you won't be able to work on another. So choose the path of least resistance. Choose the easiest tasks. Don't uh, choose the hard tasks. But uh, remember that um, 
our spiritual growth depends on choosing the right level of challenge. If you choose something which is too easy, there is no growth. If you choose something that is too hard, then you will be discouraged and abandon uh, effort. So you have to choose a medium level which needs some work, but it can be done and you can do it. And when you succeed, you feel happy. And this, uh, so this requires working your muscles at a level which, which will create change. If you put your muscles into something too hard, they will tear and uh, they will uh, be wasted. If you do some exercise that is too easy, you will not change. But if you do the exercise at the right level, you will achieve spiritual growth. So you only you can judge what is the right level for you. <coughs> so we can start by rebuilding our work relationships. So, um, so we are working in a firm. So we should try to change uh, how the firm works. Instead of thinking of firm as maximizer of profits, we should think of our firm, our workplace as provider of services. We should uh, build this spirit in ourselves. We should encourage our fellow uh, workers to also think about providing service to the public as the goal instead of making money, instead of earning wage from labor. And think of the firm as a family with social connections. And take small steps, do, do what is easy. For example, build one non-market relationship. Find someone in your firm who, whom you can make friends and say that, you know, we are working for money, but actually we should be working for uh, building, uh, uh, providing service. And we should not spend so much time on our work that it takes away from our family and so on. Find someone who is sympathetic, who has similar ideas, who is easy target. So um, do one step towards these revolutionary goals. And uh, there is one uh, common problem that arises when we start to do uh, revolutionary change. Uh, so they say that, okay, nothing can be done uh, unless we have the government. So we wait until the, we have the government in our hands and then we will do things. So that's two-step thinking. Uh, another way is to say, okay, let's first unite the Ummah at the level of Pakistan. Then we will worry about the uh, Ummah. So again, this doesn't work. Um, uh, two-step thinking is, okay, let me work on myself. And once I am a perfect person, then I will give Dawa to others. And uh, the, one of the problems that will arise in this, okay, first let me build a community. Let me make friends and let me make sure that there are lots of people. Once we have a community, then we will create change. No. Do both things together. Build a small community. Take one, two, three people and then say, okay, let's work on a problem. So work on a problem that the community, the large community would do. Work on it on a small scale because actually that work creates the community. When you say two or three, okay, let's take care of all the hungry people in our neighborhood. Okay, so it's a task which is big and large. Let's try to educate those people who don't know, don't have literacy in our neighborhood. All right, so this task requires building a school. No, I can take one person and teach. And if there are two people in, the, in my community, then we can work together. By focusing on a task, this is the way to create community. Okay, this is a job to be done. Are you willing to participate? So doing jobs creates community. Building community gives us the power to do jobs. So do both together. So how do we build a community? Uh, we have to identify the needs and the interests and the capabilities of the community. So we talk to people to find out what their uh, interests are. And we find our common uh, goals. And we try to discover the strengths and capabilities of the members try to create consensus on what are the problems we face, what are the challenges which are facing the community, and try to identify opportunities which will be created. If we work together, we can actually solve this problem. <clears throat> uh, by the way, this idea of community was lost in the West. In uh, It's a complicated thing and I am running out of time, so I won't discuss it. But basically, in the West, the only 
way of creating collective action is at the government level. Everyone has their own religion in a secular society, so they can't work together for common goals. So the only way to create collective action is the government. And some Muslims have been deceived by this into thinking that for collective action, we need the government. But that is, the, that is wrong. Actually, for collective action, we need to build a community. So uh, uh, building community is hard work, very hard work. So we need to motivate. And I have two books listed here. One is Muntakib Ahadith and Fazail Amal. And all of these describe the virtues given in the Ahadith and they are provide motivation to Muslims to do the hard work required for building a community. How do you um, build social relationships? That's something that today in a virtual world we are used to texting and, and um, building virtual relationships. So we have forgotten how to build social relationships. So we start small, work on easy people like Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he first got the message, he went to his nearest people. He went to Abu Bakr and he went to Ali. <clears throat> He went to his wife, Khadija. And so that's how you start. When you start, uh, you start with your wife or you start with your husband and uh, look for people with common interests and um, to, who, who, who already have good community with you. And then uh, there are certain skills that you need uh, to uh, listen to what the other people are saying uh, and uh, for example, free information that is given. And uh, one of the things that is very important is that learn to spot and admire small good deeds. If somebody does something very small but good, identify it and admire it and praise it and encourage it. Because you, when you encourage one small step, people will be taking bigger steps. And, and of course, Hadith tells us that tell people that you love them. Uh, for the sake of Allah. And this is also very important. Uh, communicate your praise and your admiration and your love and suppress. Do not look at their faults. Even if you see that, uh, um, even if you see them, just uh, blame your heart for looking at the faults of your brother instead of uh, telling him about it. <clears throat> there are many things we can do in terms of social events, like having a weekly uh, meeting with a few people. Don't have big parties because then, then you don't have, um, you, you, that doesn't create the social connection. And uh, discuss the Quran or something else, some common, and have some tea and have some biscuits. Um, so work together for common goals. There are many uh, methodologies for building community. One of the um, use mashwara and istikhara for uh, progress. This is very important because mashwara also builds community and istikhara gives, brings you the help from Allah to guide you in the directions. And uh, <clears throat> uh, there's one strategy from Tabligh, which is that on uh, first you try to reach a thousand people on a small scale with a little message. And then you look at who responds to this message. And with those people who respond, you work harder. So basically, this is how we should, when we try to build community, reach out to a larger people, a large number of people with a small amount of effort, and then focus your efforts on the, on the few people who will respond. And that will give you the ground roots. As soon as we start building community, we faced with a critical question. <clears throat> how should we... Yani men and women, especially the uh, uh, mixed uh, parties, etc., are not uh, uh, not uh, permitted. <clears throat> Intermingling is, uh, but one thing that is for sure is that females are much, much, much better at building community than human uh, than males. They are not, they have naturally better at this. This is what they have been built to do. And males and females have worked together from the earliest times. And there are many different standards prevailing in different uh, places, like in 
uh, in some areas in KPK in Pakistan, women and men are just very strongly isolated. But if you are living in a university, women and uh, girls and boys are just studying together in very mixed environments. So there is a lot of different <clears throat> norms. So when you arrange your meeting, you shouldn't go to extremes. You should just try to do one step better than what is dominant. So if there, if there is uh, uh, women and men are studying together in the university, you can have meetings with both women and men, but just make sure that they keep separate. Uh, do a little bit better than common, but, but don't uh, just uh, don't go to extremes. Otherwise. If you change the social norms too much, then the people in that social uh, arena will not come to you. This is a unique strength of Islam that <clears throat> we have diversity and tolerance. We allow for many different shades of meaning, uh, many different types of ways to follow Islam, and we tolerate each other. There are four different mazahib. There are uh, many Sufi traditions. They are all different. They have different rulings, different ideas. But they say we are all Muslims and we accept. The Maliki doesn't say that, you know, Shafi is out of Islam. Uh, we all say, okay, you can follow Shafi, you can follow Hanbali, you can follow Hanafi. All of them are good. So just like that, if you think of the Hajj, <clears throat> so many different groups from so many different countries. So there's Islam in Nigeria, Islam in Malaysia, Islam in... They all look very different, but they're all part of Islam. So we should... We should, uh, the difference of opinion is a mercy because different people have different temperaments. And so uh, we, we, we uh, allow for different types of communities according to different, we, we're not going to impose one fixed pattern that this is how it should be done. You, uh, you devise your community according to your local social norms. Now, communities are local, but uh, <clears throat> we need uh, action at the level of the ummah. So we have to link communities. And Islam provides us with a natural model. It says, okay, your daily prayers are at your local masjid. This builds your local community. But the Juma prayer is at a big masjid, which gathers multiple communities. So uh, we have that infrastructure already. So what we should do is when we have multiple communities, you, you are building your community in your neighborhood. Then there are uh, all the communities in your different neighborhoods. So get them together on Juma and send representatives from each community to discuss every week about common problems. Um, then the Eid al-Fitr gathers, the whole, uh, uh, gathers the whole city so you can discuss at a larger scale and Eid al-Adha gathers the whole Ummah. So this is a natural way in which the, the rituals of Islam uh, show connections at higher and higher levels. And so this is a way we can, uh, this is a pattern we can follow. One of the things we need to do is to share experiences. Uh, I'm building communities, it's a very hard task <clears throat> and I'm facing this problem. So you have any suggestions for me? So for example, Lisa has been working on building the Ghazali project in um, Indonesia for um, more than a year. So she can share her experiences and anybody else who is trying to start a group like that, they can um, share their experiences. We also have a lot of existing models. People have built communities. In, uh, in Turkey, there are lots of different communities-based uh, organizations, and they have their own methodologies. So we can learn from their experiences. But what is the key? We have to de-link from the market society. It is the market society which has conditioned us to think in terms of prices and wages and purchases and um, everything is in the market. And even, you know, to just give one example, the teacher-student relationship in Islam is a very precious relationship. The student has respect and admiration for the teacher. The teacher has love for the student and they want the student to be the best possible. But in a market relation, the teacher pays the student, uh, the, the student pays the teacher a fees and then he hires the teacher to provide him the education. This is a very different conceptualization. And it, this one is becoming more and more uh, dominant. Uh, it has already taken over in the capitalist world, but it is also becoming prevalent in the Ummah. So uh, this is, I think, the last slide and the end. And I've gone a little bit over an hour. 
and I would thought that it would, but uh, still we have some time for question and answer. So basically to conclude, a society is a network of social relationships. Market societies are defined by laborers, consumers, producers, advertisers, and <clears throat> people who spread the philosophy of markets. A natural social communities are bad for capitalism because they attach us to our community and history. Capitalism wants anonymous people. People have no connection to anyone else, so they can, they can be used as interchangeable parts as human resources. So we have to prevent ourselves from becoming a human resource and become a human being. When even when we interact with somebody in a dukan, in, in, a, in a store, we should greet them. We should ask them about their family, ask them if they are doing well and so on. So basically we have to replace market relationships with Islamic relationships. And we must build these connections and we must strengthen these connections. And these are all recommended by the teachings of Islam. So I'll stop here and we can start our question answer period. Okay, so that is all from me. And now we can take questions from the audience. All right, so uh, Usman Mustafa, yes. Can you um, unmute yourself, Farshia? Hello, are you listening Hello. my voice? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, yeah, I 100% agree that there is a wasteful consumption and wasteful production. Uh, that's not only have a socio-economic, but also have environmental degradation, which is now well documented in the most of the literature. So it's a, it's it's having a, it's creating problem for the whole society. Is wasteful Absolutely production? Absolutely, you're hundred percent right. Uh, capitalism works by exploiting people and uh, the planet. So exactly. that's what they make profits for, by cutting down trees and destroying yep. the environment. Yes. Thank you, Arish, for the very good uh, session, and, and we really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? I have, there are so many messages in the chat that I'm not sure about where to, good, um, where to uh, begin. Let's... Um, Anybody? Yes, Asif Shamas. Uh, alaikum. Yes, Asif. Okay, uh, sir. My question is like, what is a like? We just uh, you spoke about the filth of capitalism, sir. But what is the major problem with Muslim scholarship or leader, leadership these days? Like, my question is about a contemporary issue of Muslim Muslims. That these days in Pakistan, I'm seeing scholars differentiating between deen and dunyavi knowledge. And like uh, my observation could be wrong, but I observed that they complete cut off the knowledge of sciences from Islam. So what is your viewpoint about this? You see, the lecture, I was saying that Allah Ta'ala has created this entire world. Everybody else in this planet is here for my test only. So how they are, what they are doing, whether they are bad, whether they are good. It is of no concern to me because Allah Ta'ala will not ask me what the ulama were doing and what the uh, scholars were doing and what the government was doing. Allah Ta'ala is asking, what were you doing? So all of that is external environment. So the question is, what can I do? This is the only question which matters. If I can do, if I can identify what is the order of Allah for me and fulfill it, then I am successful. It doesn't matter if the whole world is going to waste. Yes, Rubaiyat. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Um, I had a question. I had a question about uh, uh, how uh, uh, you know research in fundamental science uh, or pure math. If somebody's interested in this kind of stuff, how can we? Uh, how can that work in in this sort of like a, a Islamic model? Uh, because I mean, uh, the way it works in capitalism, the way funding is gathered or like how would this work you know how, how can somebody who's interested in this 
uh, yeah. you know, that's a very good question. When which one which I have been working on for uh, my in my own life because I am a professor. So basically, the way we teach these subjects is that you will learn this in order to be able to earn a living for yourself. Uh, statistics or econometrics, economics, so that you will get a job as an economist. But uh, suppose that the teacher uh, thinks about how we can use this knowledge. to provide service to mankind this completely changes things so i have uh, yani uh, economics statistics econometrics all of these subjects change completely uh, the um the the nature of the subject what you teach and what you um uh, how you teach it everything changes when you start thinking about how we can use this knowledge to serve human humanity right so uh, if i if i may uh, uh, if i may ask a follow up question to that if you would yeah, allow sure. yeah sure so uh, in terms of uh, uh, fundamental science like for example uh, theoretical physics or something like that do you want to uh, learn something more about like you know, particle physics or something like that or neuroscience mm-hmm. uh how how can we think of this as a way to help us so can this be a way to sort of um uh, you know increase people's iman in allah that okay we by explicating yes. so a person who's not very practically oriented but very much into theoretical can that person think in this way and could that work in this model yes but um yeah that yeah, if you already have those skills uh like for example we can teach biology physics all as a sh- showing how the miracles uh, the miraculous powers of allah taala in yani the wonders of the creation it is so fantastic what allah taala has done that you know even in the physics the precision the fine tuning of the universe to the trillionth decimal place if the one of the powers of the one of the one of the planck's constant is off by one decimal place in in uh, the thousand places the whole universe would collapse so it's like a really precision tuned machine which allah taala has created so all of these there are uh, opportunities to admire allah taala says in the quran tabarakallahu ahsanul khaliqin when he talks about the creation how beautiful the creation is so this is one way to yes uh, convert but another way is that you start from the end you start by saying that uh, i want to serve mankind so what kind of technology do i need in order to do that so instead of saying that okay i have this hammer how can i use it to uh, help uh, uh, you say what are the tools that i need to help the umma so that's a different approach and it's much more useful thank you very much sir All right, uh, Lubna Shanaz. Yes, can you um, unmute? Ji, assalamu alaikum. Waalaikum assalam. Ji, आप मुझे सुन पा रहे? Can you listen me? Yes, I can hear you. जी, अगर आप मुझे allow करें तो मैं उर्दू में बात कर लूँ. कल है मगर ऑडियंस में बहुत सारे नॉन उर्दू स्पीकिंग लोग हैं ओके ओके देन आई विल टॉक इन इंग्लिश जी डॉक्टर साहब द मेन एज यू टोल्ड हियर दैट हाउ टू यूज दिस नॉलेज टू सर्व ह्यूमैनिटी इज इंपॉर्टेंट सो दिस इज द मेन सो माय पॉइंट इज हु इज टॉकिंग अबाउट दिस इन द सोसाइटी आई मीन द पीपल देमसेल्व्स हैव नो ट्रेनिंग uh to discuss this thing so how they can inculcate inculcate to the uh the students uh, in the society are you getting my point yes you are right you are right about this that very few people have so we start where we are we i mean we recognize that people don't have training so we start giving that training right yes we start and, where uh, if we have yes. at zero then we take step uh, step one step Yes, we have the Quran so, and we have the Hadith and we have the example of the Prophet's 
and how he trained the sahaba from jahiliya to uh, leaders yeah. of the world so our people are not as bad as the jahiliya no or i would say that that is the jahiliya uh, yeah uh, i mean i would say that this uh, our nation is the best but the main issue is that there is no one uh, who give them the uh, knowledge of this thing that how you have to uh, practically uh, uh, i mean this all this so islam is started by creating uh, prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam came it was exactly the same situation there was no one who who was there to give them the knowledge of islam so he started with zero so we start with zero we follow his pattern how he did it we follow the same okay let me move to suhail amin yes thank you very much walikum assalam sir i have two questions uh, first is that you have uh, given us the way forwards uh, start uh, forming communities and focusing uh, self and family and start working yes. as but could you identify some values to focus on where to start <laughs> well uh, allow me the second question also so yes the second question is uh, yes uh, we can go go ahead and start forming the communities but uh, and start working but uh, uh, the onslaught of media and the values being promoted in education institutions uh, how effective could our communities could be in uh, while in uh, in their presence thank you well when allah taala was creating mankind uh, then the angel said that why are you doing this there will be fitna and fasad and corruption and troubles and we are uh, here and live in peace and harmony so this world was created at a testing ground for us if everything was peaceful and nice and easy then there would be no test so this uh, fitna fasad this all of the all of the big problems this is a part of our test and what should we do this is a very important question as to yani when we build the community what should we do with this community this is a very important question well but there's no specific fixed answer because it will be uh, local you look at your own situations and you look at your community you look at their capabilities you look at the environment you look at what it is possible to do uh, to proceed and then you do what what is needed according to mashwara and istikhara ask allah taala for his help and guidance in terms of what needs to be done Okay, Muhammad Sama. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum assalam. Sir, I want to discuss regarding your uh, overproduction slide. Uh, yeah. If one has the capacity and resources to uh, produce excess goods and or services to fulfill the needs of other from those earnings, what's your take on it? Because yes, in society, there are certain units and there are different units. possibility then uh, and to fulfill the needs of other then this is not wasteful this is very useful if you produce bread to feed the hungry that's not wasteful that's uh, you produce 1000 bread it's, it's very useful so if you anything that is being done according to the uh, needs okay shadman zafar assalam alaikum wa alaikum assalam Uh, first of all i am very much thankful to you for having this session and uh, providing very useful insight uh, so i want to ask a question uh, for, say for the sake of argument if i say that the entire development that took place in the world and uh, that are the that are the outcome of capitalistic system be mm. it europe uh, even in india after the reforms and south asian economies when a market went towards capitalist system the development is more pronounced so how to how you how you answer such questions well And, you uh, see the greatest development took place when uh, europe looted the entire world and became rich in the process so should we then start uh, on a mission to loot uh, and colonize and exploit 
the planet so that we can also become wealthy. These are the wrong goals to pursue. Yes, Umar Javed. Yes, Umar. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum Nice to see you here. Sir, Urdu mein pushnu, if you don't mind. Oh, I'm not very good at English. That's why. All right, go ahead. Um, I have to ask you, I have two questions. The first question is that we are going to study. My sister is a doctor and my level 7 is in hospitality and tourism management. Mein. ये डॉक्टर सलीम साहब ने अभी कराची اجتماع पे कहा था कि पढ़ने के लिए इस मकसद से बाहर जाना कि ये पैसा कमाना वगैरह तो इसमें उन्होंने थोड़ा सा मुझे ऐसा कर दिया कि मैं और मिसेस पढ़ना जान पढ़ने के लिए बाहर जाना चाह रहे थे तो हमने थोड़ा सा ब्रेक ले ली कि यहीं पढ़ते हैं क्या कहते हैं इस बारे में आप दैट्स करेक्ट आई थिंक दैट गोइंग आउटसाइड टू स्टडी टू अर्न मनी इज नॉट अ गुड आईडिया एंड इट हैज कॉज आई आई डोंट जनरली एडवाइस पीपल टू गो abroad for a study for a number of reasons uh, but this is a very specific uh, question you can ask me separately uh, let me ask uh, this uh, ipad no name um, yes ipad can you un unmute and uh, ask me your question I am Muhammad Ashraf Kovakar. Sir, indeed, okay. it was a very good lecture and a uh, lot of learning out of it. I am very grateful. May Allah bless you at most. Mm -hmm. My question is, sir, as an individual, what tools and capability which one uh, God has gifted to any individual and he, he if he polishes from within to promote Islamic social concept or counter market strategy i didn't understand can you say that again what i want to say that allah taala has given capabilities and tools within an individual yes what should he promote more or most to pr to well, enhance islamic con social strategy and I've, I've, and counter capitalism i've said that capitalism works by creating a network of social relationships we should weaken those build islamic style relationships and ask allah taala for his guidance shadman zafar uh, thank you sir for giving me another chance uh, sir even if we we understood well about the flaws in the capitalistic system but uh, i think so there is no exit even if we go to any muslim countries or living in non muslim countries europe west everywhere but there is no exit at all we have to uh, enter into labor force we have to be a consumer at all front yes i am so not asking that you should exit i am just saying reduce your engagement put the family over the career Put social relationships over market relationships. That's all. Prioritize one over the other. No exit. Uh, let me ask Noha because I haven't seen her for a long time. Can you um, ask me a question? Assalamu alaikum, Professor Asad. Okay. Uh, yes, it's so nice catching up with you finally. And mm -hmm. I wish you and uh, all uh, the people a blessed Ramadan. Uh, exactly. Thank you for this very useful, as usual, uh, lecture, enlightening. And uh, my question is, there was this slide on um, curtains of light. And you yes. mentioned um, the, that no un-Islamic means to reach an Islamic goal. So can you please clarify it? And uh, maybe if, uh, and if it's, it's a big topic, if it means something uh, more personal for me, then maybe I email you. But can you just yeah. give me a brief this clarification? This is a terminology I took from the Sufi uh, paths that they have said that in order to, in the path to Allah, there are curtains of darkness. And after that, after you get through them, then there are curtains of light, things which appear to be from the noor, but actually uh, they are obstacles to the noor of Allah. So that's roughly it. And uh, getting more detail would be difficult. Yani there, are, there are things which appear to be very pious and religious. 
for example suppose that you are uh, told that okay there are so many blessings in reading the quran so you should spend all day and nights reading the quran and you do that well then you get deprived of doing the much bigger good which is necessary and urgent and uh, like there is this famous hadith about the woman who uh, people said that she prays all day uh, all night and she is fasts all day so the prophet sallallahu asked that who does her housework so she said all the neighbors help so she allah uh, prophet said that they are do, they are better off they are better because they are doing the work that is needed so that's yes. what i mean thank you so <clears throat> much you're welcome amreen uh, assalam alaikum sir um no. my question is that uh, in the market economy there is a price of everything and value of nothing so uh, oh, yes. for jobs like uh, teaching and for jobs like uh, the judge who have to be in difference uh, to make decision and they can make or, or create or destroy the society there so how to um, uh, define how to make the incentive structure for them to do their job uh, best uh, uh, in the interest of the society and not in the interest of like uh, earning money and the second question arises because of this uh, question that uh, i was asked by a brother that uh, I'm going out of the country for study um i want to ask that is it necessary to communicate uh, like uh, create community in your um, of uh, um, like a country or something because i find it more easy more enabling environment outside the country to work on such things and i have other role models like triple it um, i have uh, um, the chance to meet the um, founders of them like they worked in america to create triple it because the country um, from where they were coming was not uh, allowing them to do such things so what do you say in this regard like well as i said everyone is in a different place and i said follow the path of least resistance wherever allah taala guides you and wherever is easy so for some people it will be easy to build local community for some people it will be easier to go elsewhere to build so do whatever whatever is comes easiest to you do mashwara and istikhara daniel assalam alaikum sir can you hear me wa alaikum assalam yes i can Okay sir so uh, in the beginning uh, you know you told us that this western epistemic framework is faulty and you are absolutely right the way it conceives man and the kind of purposes it gives us uh the thing is uh, and then you also to- told us that you know we should move away from wants to needs uh but you know th- what i reckon from it is this that uh, it's a matter of how we conceive and think but then you know i think it's a matter of how we feel as well so absolutely yeah so it means that you know it it is not possible without ehsan first thing so i would like to have your comment on that secondly uh i was reading this book by uh, ibn khaldun the muqaddima few few months back i guess so hmm. you know there are two models evolutionary and revolutionary and yes. obviously you know you were encouraging that evolutionary model and i am inclined towards that as well that first we bring change in ourselves and then you know ultimately the society would uh, change <clears throat> so he wrote in that book a line and i you know that line a little bit chattered this idea not chattered this idea but you know made me a little confused he said that uh, uh, the religion of the average man is or average man is on the religion of the elites or the powerful so i mean how do you you know make sense of this statement uh, within that framework of evolution so these are just two uh, aspects i would like to have your comment on thank you thank you very much sir hmm i don't really know i as far as the ehsan is concerned i have given a link for that um a, a lecture of mine on ehsan and um, as far as this is concerned this is a entangled proposition that is the leaders are chosen from us so what they follow is uh, what will we will what um, values we develop will be the values that our leaders follow also so mohammed haq i think this has to be the last question we are already over the time limit uh hello professor assalam alaikum i'm from the Salam uk uh So my name is Imran Hawk. Actually, my first name is Muhammad. There, uh, 
Uh, uh, so I'm an economist by profession. Uh, I'm, at uni- I'm at University of Manchester. I've been following your lectures uh, and I'm quite intrigued uh, about your thought and uh, thank you for the excellent uh, presentation today. Uh, mm-hmm. And I love the, uh, your idea of say, uh, you know, moving towards the social relationship, you know, prioritizing over social, prioritizing on social relationship over market relationship. Mm-hmm. Uh, my comments and uh, there are, I've got just two comments and I want uh, your uh, take on it. Uh, mm-hmm. One is actually from your presentation, uh, mm-hmm. you're saying that, you know, we need to try to earn money. Uh, this is what I could understand, not only for myself, but also for others. So, uh, you, Earn you know, money for myself and for others. I didn't. I don't uh, recognize. No, just that. Uh, basically, you know, in order to uh, move away from the capitalistic, greedy, profit maximization idea, mm-hmm. if you mm-hmm. work on, say, for example, for yourself, you uh, uh, look for maybe basic needs or. Uh, how do I say, you know, like decent living, but at the same time, maybe uh, you could try to earn money for helping others. Oh, Uh, no, no. I said, if you have money, uh, uh, then uh, basically, instead of uh, capitalism encourages us to spend this on our own desires. Instead of spending around desires, we should spend on needs of others. So this is just a substitution that we should do that will help us to uh, to get away from this mentality of pursuing the desires of the nurse, which is created by capitalism and it is essential yes. to the survival of capitalism that everyone yeah. should pursue their ideal desires. Yes. So if somebody ha- you know, keeps that objective in his mind when he's pursuing uh, at the worldly level, Maybe the mm-hmm. you know that could help himself and also to this also the society. If you think about you know uh, most successful people financially, say multi-millionaires, billionaires in the Western society, you will see that you know say if I just give an example of Warren Buffett or maybe Bill Gates, why do they you know after building big empire of their uh, billionaire empire you know. Uh, mm-hmm. Why do they go for charity? Found you know creating because foundations. They spend that money themselves. Uh, uh, no, there is a, there is a uh, there is a sense of feeling there that when somebody becomes successful, they cannot spend their money on themselves only. So that's why they have to reach out to the other people. Uh, so uh, I think that's the point. You know what is uh, your thought on it? Uh, uh, that's the, a very complicated uh, discussion, and uh, next lecture I will be saying something about that. Uh, and the the other issue is about you know, uh, you know, from your lecture I was just thinking you know, uh, Allah has taught us to make dua, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana. By mm-hmm. doing so, basically, uh, He is uh, asking us to pursue both dunya with hasana and akhirah with hasana together. This should be complementary, you know, like worldly pursuit with hasana should be complementary to the uh, pursuit for akhirah. So, but our murabbis and, you know, the elders, uh, they tend to advise us, if you want to pursue the Islamic life, uh, you should just only focus on akhirah. So that's why we are losing out in this world, uh, you know, all the... Uh, I think that know. this, uh, what I have suggested is not to retire into caves and pursue the Akhara. I've said that we build community, we provide service to our family and neighbors. So uh, where is the... <coughs> this is all worldly stuff. So there is no retirement and no... Uh, no danger of uh, abandoning the world. And it is actually, this is the hasanat of this world is loving others and being loved. And this is something which is absent from capitalism. It is paying for, (coughs) which is just built on market relationships, not social relationships. The hasanat of this world are 
not the goods of this world. They are the social relationships it's being loved and, and loving. Okay, I think we have gone way over time. So I think we should stop now. <coughs> <coughs> Thank you, everybody. Subhana Rabbi Karabbil Yazate. Amma Yasafun. Wa salamun al-Mursaleen. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil Alameen. Thank you, everyone.